just remember uh, to be bringing in your crayons. If you want to bring in crayons, it's the uh, Crazy Art or um, Crayola. Trying to get 40,000, and I talked to Brother Marvin today, and he said that um, he needed uh, need them by the 15th. I think originally that said the 5th, but they extended it to the 15th, and he said as long as we got them by that week, he would come by and pick them up that week, and he'd be delivering them. So all we got to do is give them to him. So around the August, we'll just say the fifth. We can keep it the fifth, but fifteenth uh, at the latest. Uh, we'll try to get them the crayons. Also, if there's anybody that feels uh, led to um, uh, go to the training, it's this Friday and Saturday. Friday from six to ten, and Saturday from nine to five. It's a twelve-hour training, but it's to be into the school, get to go into the schools and uh, teach these kids using their um, character under construction. And I do believe they do teach um, character, but I know uh, in that there'll be questions. Where, where do, what, how do you know what's true? Or how do you know what's right and wrong? And that opens the door to um, sharing the gospel. I, I know uh, uh, I know they do a great work with that. So if you do want to do that, that's kind of the line of call um, for that. Um, but we'll go to the Lord in prayer. We'll just go ahead and um, start. Musician, if Gary wants to come on up, we'll go ahead and uh, ask the Lord to bless our service here this evening. Looking forward so much to this message here tonight. Uh, if you're watching online, I pray that you share it and we'll get the word out here this evening. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just, uh, we're thankful for the day you've given us. We're thankful for letting us come back to your house, Lord, and thankful for the ability to live stream and for those that's not here this evening. And Lord, we just thank you for your uh, hand of protection you've had on each and every one of us, allowing us to come back. Thank you, Lord, for every family that makes up our church that's uh, represented here tonight, Lord, and uh, this is our, our, our core group of church members here on a Wednesday night, but Lord, I'm praying that you just help us and bless us with this uh, message here this evening, and Lord, I, I know it'll be a help to, for us all, uh, just looking forward to sharing it and delivering it here this evening. You just be with us in this time, uh, let us dig deeper and be different than when we came into church here this evening, in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You'll stand, we'll sing. Oh, how I love Jesus.
go toward the, the use of these missionaries that we have around the country and around the world. Pray in your name and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now be with us in all that we do. And again, bless this offering for us in Jesus' name we ask. Amen. Appreciate the Lord this evening. If you've got your Bibles, it's been Second Kings, Second Kings again. We were we were there this past Sunday. The Lord uh, put us back, and that's fine. We'll just try to mind the Lord here this evening. Uh, just wonder, uh, anybody got a word on your heart or anything as we're finding your place? Just try to mind the Lord here this evening. Appreciate Him allowing us to come back, and uh, didn't post anything on Facebook about us having church. We're just having it. Even if it snows, we're having it. So that's just the way it is. You can sit, we can sit at home and worry about things, or we can just come to church. So I do appreciate the Lord this evening allowing us to come back and uh, get in the message He's got in store for us. I appreciate it. But anybody have anything? Anything? Got a lot of good reports from our uh, members. And Amen. 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 Reports. So thanks for that. Amen. Just so thankful for those reports. Like he said, uh, Harper's feeling better. Cody's got that job. Ralph got a good report, and uh, Eddie's got that good report. So everything that we've been in prayer and truly is feeling better. So out of all the things, that's five things right there. Uh, nothing negative to say about the Lord. There's five good things, and we just want to honor him this evening. So he is a good God. Yes. All right. Well, and we'll be in Second Kings chapter number uh, four. We were here this past Sunday, both services, I believe, was uh, this, this past Sunday. We looked at this text, especially Sunday morning. But uh, there was a title there above verse number 38 that caught my eye. And uh, it wasn't in this Bible, but another Bible. It says, Elisha purifies the deadly stew. And I read that, and I said, I ain't never heard of that. And it caught my attention, and I just kept coming back to it. I tried to go in a different route, but I believe it's what the... Lord wanted. I uh, started uh, had this verse on my heart. Started going another direction. Then again, he uh, went back to this, and I had two things: it was this text and the church. And I said, "How in the world are we going to get the church out of some deadly stew?" But we'll see what the Lord's got in store. Verse number thirty-eight says this, 
And if you'll stand for the reading of God's word, it says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a certain dearth in the land. And uh, the, the sons of the prophets were sitting before him, and, they, and, and he said to his servant, Sit on the great pot and see the pottage for the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full, and came and, and shared, them in, or shared them into the pot uh, for the pottage, and they, and they knew them not. And so they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried and said, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said, Then bring meal and cast it into the pot. And he said, Pour out thy pe pour out for the people, and they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. And there came a man from Belshazzar and brought the man of God bread of the first fruits, twenty loaves of barley, and a full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people, and they may eat. And his servitors said, What should I set before the hundred men? And he said again, Give the people that they may eat. Thus saith the Lord, and they shall eat and leave thereof. So he set it before them, and they did eat and left thereof according to the word of the Lord. Your heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for this message that you've given us here this evening. Lord, we're just praying that you help us. We're praying here that you bless us and, and give us what we need, something we can chew on here this week and, uh, and help us. Help us be a better church. Help us be better Christians. Help us uh, just grow in, in you this, this evening. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Again, I, I looked at this uh, scripture Sunday morning. We looked at uh, going through seasons of life uh, this past Sunday morning. And we looked at that uh, Shunammite woman there in, in 2 Kings chapter number 4 and how she, uh, the, Elisha said, you're going to have this son. And she has that son and he dies and ends up healing him, raising him from the dead. And we're talking about different seasons of life and how we go through uh, different things in life. But then uh, that message again, it caught my eye. Elisha purifies the deadly stew. And again, I, I tried to go in a different direction, but I kept coming back to this text. And then the Lord started directing us and showing us what we need to say. So really what I had in, in starting this message before the Lord started giving it to us was in 2 Kings 4, 38 through 44, we had that text. We had the word church, and he wants it to the church. And I said, how in the world are we going to preach this? But the main text I want to look at and where the, the title of the message comes from is verse number 40. If you look at the last line there, verse number 40, it says, O thou man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. And I want to preach for a moment on that title, death in the pot, that there's death in the pot. Now, it all began, number one, with some hunger. You had to be hungry uh, and wanting something to eat for death to uh, eventually get in this uh, pot. In verse number 38, uh, look at the start of that verse. It says, And Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was a, a dearth in the land. That sounds like Darth Vader or some dearth in the land. But what that is, is it, it, it is a hunger. And specifically, it comes from a famine, a hunger that has arise through a famine, or specifically, more than likely, through a drought. Now, there's several places in the, in the book of 2 Kings where you find this drought that's mentioned. I mean, it was a drought that lasted uh, uh, many, uh, several years, and it's mentioned several times. In 2 Kings uh, 6 and verse number 25, it says, And there was a great land, uh, there was a great famine in Samaria. So there was a great famine. Now, we not, not only read there it was a famine, but we read it was a great famine. In 2 Kings chapter number 8, in verse number 1, at the end of that verse, it says, For the Lord hath called for a famine. So I read that there wasn't just a famine. It was a great famine, not only just any famine. It was a famine that was called on by God. And it says, It shall also come upon 
on the land for seven years. So I also see that that was a great famine. It was a famine. It was a great famine, but it was called on by the Lord, but it also lasted seven years. This is a lengthy famine. And the Lord's the one called this famine. And that's why we get in verse number 38 of our text, Elisha came again to Gilgal, and there was this dearth uh, in the land. It was a famine. There was a hunger in the land. So there's there's a hunger going on. There's people wanting something going on. Now, I truly believe that, that uh, this can relate to us in this world that we live. I believe there's a hunger in this world that we live. Now, here in America, there's literal hunger in in Africa and some of these foreign lands and, and something that we don't know so much of. Who knows who's to say that we won't know of hunger before it's all said and done. But I will say this, uh, when it comes to hunger it, and it comes to uh, this, I believe uh, one th thing that we can relate to when it comes to hunger is there's a hunger for something. There's a hunger for the things of God. There's a hunger for some kind of longing to satisfy our soul. I really believe that uh, is how we can relate to this text. Yes, there's a famine in this land, but there's a famine when it comes to God, and a desire for God. There's a famine. There's a uh, there's not a lack of God, but there's a lack of a desire of God. That, that we need that hunger. And, he's, and, it, and Elisha sees this hunger. And he says there in verse number 38, at the end of that verse, he says, sit on the great pot. It sounds like you're going to the bathroom or something. Sit on the great pot. But he says, see and see the pottage for the sons of the prophet. That word pottage means bold, or here specifically it's a soup. So here we are. We see a hunger. There's a hunger in the land, a famine in the land. He says, hey, bring me, bring that pot. Bring that pot. And I got us one here this evening. Thankful for a wife that go down the down the basement and grab it and not ask no questions. She just said, I don't know where he's going with the message, but I'm gonna go get the pot. <laughs> but here's the pot. So we've got the pot. He says, Go get it. There's hunger in the land. I know people's hungry. You just fetch me that pot. Bring it over here, and uh, we'll figure out something that we can put in. We'll we'll get them something to eat. The first thing I see is I see a hunger. Second thing I see is in verse number 39, it says, and, I, and one went out in the field to gather herbs and found a wild vine and gathered thereof wild gourds in his lap full and came and shared them into the pot of the pottage for they knew them not. So we begin by reading here in verse number 39, it says, and one went out. So we got one person that, that goes out so I see when I think about this hunt and we, we see about this hunt that one person heads out. It's an individual hunt. And they go out and they start gathering. And I don't know if you could eat this, this lily or not. It's probably a pretty good uh, illustration right here. So he goes out and he starts gathering these leaves. And he starts gathering. And it's individual. And I want to say this, that it was never God's plan. It was never God's purpose. It was never God's desire for one person to go out individually. I mean, and I believe it lines up with the scripture, but we see that one went out, and it was an individual hunt. One went out, he went out into the fields, uh, and, and I know scripturally that we shouldn't be doing this, but in Mark 6 and 7, Jesus was sending out his 12, and in Mark 6 and 7, he says, send them forth two and two. He says, hey, this is a 12. I'm going to send six groups. There's two, there's two, there's two. And you're supposed to send them out two by two. But then the Lord also talks about 70 others. In, in Luke 10, in verse number 1, it says, after these things, the Lord appointed other 70 also and sent them two by two. So here in this text, though, back in 2 Kings, we've got one man going out individually. Shouldn't be done really scripturally, but one man goes out individually. He goes out and gathering. So why would he send two, though? Why should we not go by one, but why should we go by two? One, you don't know what they're gathering. We'll get to that in a minute. But two, there's more power. There's more strength. There's more trust. There's more of everything if you've got two. I mean, here in the day that we live, my gosh, we go knocking on doors. We need to go two by two. You don't want to go alone, do you? You really don't. It's like Marvin. That's why he's trying to get these volunteers to go into the schools. It's, he don't want to go one by one. He's wanting to go the way the Bible says. He's wanting to go two by two. 
So see here in the in the text there in, in 2 Kings, it was an individual hunt there in verse number 39. And one went into the fields to gather the herbs, and they found the wild vine. Now, I see here that it was individual, and they send him out, and he starts gathering these things. But it was a directed hunt. It's individual, but he directed it. He was directed to get the ingredients to fill this pot, get the ingredients needed to, to, to put in this pot to hopefully feed some people. And I tell you, don't that, uh, it was a directed hunt. In other words, they needed to fill the people. Don't that sound a lot like 2022? People's looking for something to fill them up, something to fill a longing in their heart. They're looking for money. They're looking for uh, drugs or sex or whatever it is, but they're looking for something kind of longing to fill themselves. I'll tell you, it comes from the Lord, don't it? That's foreshadowing what we're going to get into a minute. But if we need to be filled and we need uh, our longing and desires to be filled, it's going to have to come from the Lord. But we see here in verse number 39, and one went out into the field, he gathered herbs, and found the wild vine, and gathered thereof wild gourds, his lap full. This wild vine is believed to be some kind of poisonous vine. Doesn't really say what it is, but he gathered it up, gathered up something he shouldn't gather. Sounds like my sister in third grade, they sent him outside for a, a leaf hunt, made their little journal with a leaf book. That's half a class that pulled poison sumac and half a class was out. <laughs> I remember that to this day. She was all swelled up. But he, he, she, he's gathered up some kind of poison, this wild vine. But then I read this, and a gourd don't really sound that bad. I've never ate one, but it sounds kind of like a pumpkin or a squash or something to me. In verse number 39, he says, uh, he found this wild vine, but he gathered thereof wild gourds, a lap full. Now, these wild gourds, uh, they've got this name called coloquint. And it's a fruit, and, it, and I looked it up, and it looks it reminds you a lot like a cucumber. It comes up in this wild, this vine. It's got those leaves like a cucumber has, and grows on the ground. They say it's about the size of an orange. It looks yellow. It says uh, when they get ripe, I guess, and green as they start coming. Uh, but that that fruit, it, it's the same family there as a cucumber, about the size of a large orange. But here's the thing about them: they're very bitter. They, they don't taste so, don't taste so good. So this individual goes out. It's an individual hunt. Then it's a directed hunt. His direction is, hey, I got to get something to put in this pot. I got to get something uh, uh, so when I get home, uh, we get back, we can have something to eat because we're all hungry. Now here's the thing you got to remember: the reason they're hungry is there's a famine in the land. When there's a famine in the land and they depended on the, this, uh, the, the land, they depended on their animals, they depended on uh, the, the, a famine, don't just hurt them uh, as far as uh, with the food, it hurts them financially as well because they was unable to, um, as unable to uh, they were hurting money-wise too, uh, and able to sell their crops and things. There's a famine, it hurt them as far as growing food, but also selling food as well. In verse number 39, look what we see at the end of that verse. It says he got that lap full. He came and he shred them, them into the pot, in the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So he gets this wild stuff. He gets it. He starts putting it, gathers it up, starts putting it in the pot. And these people, they're so hungry. They're just looking for something. They're looking for something to satisfy their desire. They're looking for some kind of something or another that they could eat. And look at verse uh, number 40. Verse number 40, I read this. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass when they were eating of the pottage that they cried out and said, Oh, man of God, there is death in the pot, and they could not eat thereof. So what happens is they cook this pot, and they stirred it up, he dishes it up, and you know somebody, they ain't even probably blessed the meal, and somebody's done digging in. And they said, oh my gosh, it's bitter. That's that wild gourd that they're eating of. It tasted bitter. Then he also had, you seen it in verse number 39, that wild vine, very poisonous. So they taste of this, they taste of, uh, of this, a soup that they've made, and then in verse number 40, we get the title of the message there, Death in the Pot. And they could not eat thereof. 
Listen to this. How many of you have been hungry before? A lot of times we say we're hungry, but I don't even know if we even know what real hunger truly is. But if we've really been hungry, have you ever been so hungry that you you open the pot, that you, you started dishing it out, and you're so hungry, but then you don't eat? Most of us, even if it ain't good, we still eat it, don't we? I don't know if I've ever sat at a time where I was hungry and didn't just go ahead and eat it. It was so bad that I couldn't eat it. I guess the only thing I could say at that time, I was ready to sop up that chocolate gravy and they put my gravy, put that salt in it. And I told you before, that's the only thing I can think of that I couldn't eat it. But you might say, how does this apply to us? I know that we get hungry from time to time and we get hungry for God and, and we hunger after the things of God. How does this apply to us? Well, here's what I think. I think we get hungry and, and we, get, we get hungry and we get hungry. And, and here's the thing, that when you get hungry and you're, you're just longing for something, let's backtrack just a minute. We've lived in two years of chaos in this world. You can't watch the news and know what's going on. We're living in a day of turmoil. Uh, we're hearing of climate change now and all this mess. We're, we're hearing of all, every, all kinds of just, uh, we don't know what to believe. We're he hearing of everything. We're living in a day where we need something to eat of that's, that's good. Something to eat of that would satisfy that hunger. I believe everybody's hungry. And I definitely know the world's hungry, but I know the church is hungry. We're hungry. But the problem is, a lot of times when we look around and we see the empty pew, and we look around and, and, and we, uh, we say, Why, we're so-and-so, we want to satisfy that hunger, and we want to substitute God for other things. And I was just thinking a little bit this evening, and I was thinking of some different things that we substitute, and I'll tell you this, we put that death in the pot, we don't realize it's death when we first put it in and we start filling up that pot, but one thing a lot of times we put in the pot sometimes is, is we'll change the Word of God. In other words, we will say, I want a, I want a Bible that's different. I want a Bible that don't really call sin, sin. I want a different Bible. Or I want a, just a Bible I can understand. But I, I, here's the thing. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful uh, because what happens is death is, is brought, brought upon us. Death is put in that pot. Because, see, I think there's two things that, that I'm going to be getting ahead of myself. There's two things that I think we need to learn. One is never send somebody out alone. Don't go alone. You got to send, go two by two. I think that's something we can apply in our life. But the second thing is that we can apply to our life is be careful what we put in the pot. And, and what we're trying to do, in other words, I'm trying to put something in this pot, put something to fill up. I'm hungry. There's a famine going on. I need something to satisfy, something I can just taste. But here's the thing. We, a lot of times what we do is to, to appease that and to bring in a crowd or what we do to, 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 to satisfy these longings is we change God's word. We change his word. And we say, hey, I want something that's easier to understand. We change his word. I'm just saying it going on. I'm talking about the universal church where we're messing up as a universal church. We're, tr we're getting death out of the pot, but what we're doing is we're changing God's word. Another thing a lot of times with the universal church that we do is we'll change Sunday school. In other words, uh, a lot of times I see churches now, they, call, they have small groups or growth groups or life groups. In other words, they don't really have Sunday school no more. They'll sit around and drink coffee and question the Bible. I tell you, it's not about, this is not to be questioned. It's to be taught, learned about, and, and applied to your life and be different. But that's the problem. Uh, it, oh, it's cool. It's different. It's unique. And they want to do these things. But what's happening is, in the pot, you've got something that you end up, you can't even eat when you got it. A lot of times we want to change other music. What about the music in the church? Let's go more contemporary. There's, there's empty views in this church. If the preacher just go more contemporary and, and, and change, we don't have to change all that to, to get the crowd. In other words, you have a pot of something to eat, and you end up dead in that pot, and you couldn't even eat it to begin with. Think about the pastor. We just need a different pastor. We need one that don't tell the truth like that, just somebody that just uh, preaches love, and God is a God of love. He's a God of mercy. And I want to feel good when I leave here. You can do that if you want, but what we're going to end up with is we're going to end up with a pot of stew, have a pot, you're going to dish it out, and it's not going to be good. We've even, I've even seen churches changing the whole atmosphere of a church. I bet you've seen it online, you've seen it different places, maybe even been to one. 
And you go into churches and it, they, they, they paint it all black on the inside. That's a new thing now. It's not to finish the roof, but leave it all empty, the ceiling, but leave it all empty on the inside. That way you can still see the pipes. It looks like an unfinished church. You put your spotlights down. Take out the pulpit, put a bar stool, put a put a band. So I'm not it, I'm describing a literal church, but it don't sound like a church. It sounds like something different. And you may say, what is he saying? How does this relate to you? I don't know. That's just what the Lord uh, wanted me to preach on this evening. Because I know a lot of times we leave here and we say, why is that pew here? Why is that pew? Where's somebody at? Where did that family go? What's that family at? I, I, I don't, I don't, all I know is this. I'm not going to put death in the pot. I ain't going to have nothing to eat if, it, if it's like that. And we're not going to change and end up with something that we can't eat. And it's all said and done. See, I see a hunger, but I also see a hunt. I see that there's a hunt for something to go in that pot. What did they find? They found that wild vine, and they found that wild gourd to put in the pot. You may say, well, what do we need then? Well, I see a hunger, and I, I feel a hunger. I'm hungry right now, but there's a, there's a literal hunger. I think we're hungry, hungry for the things of righteousness in the Lord. We need something in this day. But I see a hunger. I see a hunt for something. I think people's hunting for some kind of something. But you may say, why do you say all them things and they don't apply to us? I just think we've got to be on guard. And, and we don't want to tickle our emotions and miss out and have death in that pot. But the last thing I want to say here this evening is we have to have a heavenly touch. See, how many of you realize you can have all those things I just said? You can sip your coffee while I preach. But if you ain't got a heavenly touch, my gosh, you've done missed the boat. You might as well go down to uh, the, the Starbucks and get you a latte, and there's no different if there's no heavenly touch there. Because look at verse number 41. It says, but he said, then bring meal. So here is, here is Elisha, and he tells them, he says, hey, bring me some meal. That's, that's strange to me. You've got a You've got some soup with that wild thyme. You've got soup with that wild gourd. You've got somebody that's done tasted it, spit it out, said it's disgusting, it's dangerous, it's going to kill us. And then here you've got Elisha, and he says, hey, bring me the meal. What's the meal? Well, the meal's the flour. He says, hey, give me some flour and, and bring it to me. That word meal, it comes from uh, kind of where you get flour from. It's meal, it's grinded to, to make that flour. And what God tells Elijah, and he's a man of God, what he tells him to do is put some flour in that pot. He, they just bring it to him. He takes that flour. He says, all right, I'm going to put a little flour in that pot. I'm going to make it good. I'm going to put a little more. I'm just going to put it all in that pot. I'm going to make that make it better because he can't eat it. If he can't eat it, nobody's going to want it. Nobody's going to desire it. And, and if we're going to make soup, there's a famine. If the man of God told me to do it, I'm just going to do it. If God tells me to do it, I'm going to do it because I'm tired of being hungry. I'm tired of going through the emotions. I'm tired of, you know, acting like uh, that God's here and he ain't. I'm tired of uh, having soup and it, 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 nothing to that soup and I can't eat that soup. So I'm just going to do it. I'm going to do whatever it takes. God will tell us sometimes to do things that don't make sense, but, it, but we do it. You know what I believe that flower represents? I believe that flower represents the Lord. In, in, John, in John 6 and 35, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. And you know that verse. But he's the bread of life. What do we use, what do we use to make flour? Uh, to make bread? Flour. A lot of times we make, use flour. It says, I am the bread of life, and he that cometh to me shall never hunger. And he that believeth in me shall never thirst. We're living in a world that we think that out there, we're, when we come into the house of God, we're missing something when we come in here. In other words, there's something out there that we need. So what we're going to do is we're going to bring out there in here to make us more comfortable, to make us feel like uh, that we've got God, and we hunt for entertainment, we hunt for comfort, we hunt for wealth, we hunt for uh, a feeling, and what we end up with is a pot full of something that we can't even eat to begin with because there's death in the pot. That's what we've got, and that's what a lot of churches have got in this state that we live. But we need a heavenly touch. All along, we need a heavenly touch. There's a, there's a hunger. They go out hunting, 
All that was in vain. All those things you brought into church and all those things that you brought and put in the pot, it wasn't even worth having to begin with. You didn't need it. You did not need it. Give me three things that I see here in this text that I find about this heavenly touch. He put that flower in, and that's the heavenly touch. I want to give you three things about this heavenly touch. One thing is, you realize that flower was right there. Now you didn't have to go out and get it. Elisha's right there. They've got the soup, and it's messed up. And he says, hey, just hand me the meal. The meal was right there. And it was right there the whole time. The ingredient to fix it, the ingredient to fix everything was right there. In verse number 41, he says, but he said, then bring, then bring the meal. They thought they had to go out looking for it. They thought they had to bring it all in. But here's the thing. They brought it in. And what did they get in verse number 40? Death in the pot. It was death in the pot. I'm never in my life, never going to call nobody's food death in the pot, are you? Somebody cooking my food, death in the pot. But, I, but the thing was that the ingredient to help it, the ingredient that they needed was the meal. And where was the meal? It was right there. Just go get it and let's fix this thing. You may say, what's he saying? Well, I'm saying this. You know where Jesus is at? He ain't in, he ain't in the light show and all that. You, we can do whatever. I'm not against all of whatever we got to do. But here's the thing. Look, you can't, you, you got to have Jesus. You can bring in all the lights under the sun. Every light. We can have a rainbow up here. But hey, if Jesus ain't here, we've missed it. It's got to be. And, and where is he? He's right here. When's the last time we came to this altar and just think, he's right here. You care if you're saved, you brought him in. He's in your heart. He passes by. Sometimes in those songs, if we listen up, he'll, he'll tug on our heartstrings. Jesus is right there. Where was that flare? And I don't see him saying, going to Walmart or go to Eagles and get that flare. He just said, hey, just bring it. And it was right there. I think the problem in America and the problem in our churches in this day is Jesus is right here and we're looking for every ingredient to put in there. But he's right here. And there ain't no substitute for Jesus. There's no substitute for that thing. But that heavenly touch was right there. Another thing I see about that heavenly touch is that heavenly touch fixed the poisonous stuff. That poisonous stuff is still in there. They're still there. I just put the heavenly touch in there with the poisonous stuff. We still live in a broken world. We still live in a world that lives for themselves. And we still live in this, in this shattered, broken, dark, desperate, desolate world. We still live there. But all it took was that meal to fix it all. And, that, and, and, and the, the, the poison, that uh, poisonous stuff is still in the pot. It just took the meal to fix it. You may say, what's going to fix this, this world that we live in? Jesus. I'm not kicking the people out. I want you to come in. We don't want to pull this stuff out. We want them to come in. What's going to help them? Jesus. Jesus is what's going to help them. Jesus is what's going to fix them. So see, that heavenly touch, was it was something that was right there. It was right there to be to be uh, uh, right there at their hands. They didn't have to go out and get that meal. But then I see the poison's still there. See, I'm still sinful. You're still sinful. The poison's still there. The poison's still in the pot. I still fail and I still come short. But that don't mean Jesus ain't there. That don't mean that the main ingredient ain't there. That don't mean the meal ain't there. But lastly, I see that that heavenly touch is better than you imagine. See, we can have a heavenly touch. And, and, and we say, man, that soup's going to be fixed. Yeah, but it's better than that. It's better than that. See, they were hungry. There's a famine going on. They, they're, they're starving to death. And in 2 Kings 4 and 41, we read that that soup is fixed. It says, and he said, bring the meal. And he cast it in the pot. And he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no harm in the pot. Now, what is death in the pot? You put Jesus in, and now there's no harm in the pot. You put death, you put Jesus in our life, and you may be experiencing death in your own life, but there is no death. There's Jesus there. But, but here's the thing. This is amazing. If we could get God in our church, if we could get God in our lives, 
Do you realize that this right here is just the appetizer? Jesus coming by and fixing that nasty soup. Jesus coming by and giving us something to eat. One time, it's just the appetizer. Because if you keep reading this text, in verse number 42, it says, And there came a man from Belshazzar. Now, I've said that different both times. Missed it both times, probably. But they brought a man of God, a, a bread of the first fruits. You know what a bread of the first fruits are? It's his first fruits. It's the first thing. The first thing before he partake of anything, his first fruits, he's supposed to give it to somebody. you got to go back. There's a famine going on. Here's somebody in a famine. What would we do in a famine? What would we do if times got hard? Gas gets to $10 a gallon. Will we give our first fruits? Will we give our tithes to the church? What the Bible says, but hey, here it is with a famine going on, and he's giving the first fruits. He's still giving it. He's still giving it to God. He's not stacking up. He's not. And God's coming by in a, in a magnificent way. He says, the bread of the first fruits, 20 loaves of barley, and a full, full and full ears of corn in the husk thereof. And he said, Give unto the people that they may never uh, they may eat. And the servitor said, What should I what shall I set this before a hundred men? In other words, I've got this food. Uh, they've ate of this, uh, they've ate of this uh, uh, soup, uh, and I ain't got enough of this to give everybody. Am I supposed to give this to a hundred men? And he said, Give to the people that they may eat, and thus saith the Lord, they shall eat and leave thereof. In other words, you're going to give it to the people. They're going to eat, and there's going to be leftovers. There's going to be something to take with you. In other words, God's good enough to satisfy your hunger. God's good enough to uh, fill that pot and make it taste good. And he's not even going to just give you that. He's going to give you more. And when he gives you more, you're going to be able to take it with you and take it out into this world. And in verse number 44, it says, So he said it before them. He gave it to them. And they did eat and left. Thereof. The soup was fixed. The soup was fixed. And it was good enough to eat. But when you get a heavenly touch, it ain't God just exceeds our expectations. And in rolls a man with his first fruits, his first fruits offering, and the law was to give that to the priest. And here we are in verse number 38, Elisha. And these prophets sitting there together. Here is this man rolls in with his first fruits. Not enough for everybody, but God blesses and gives it to everybody. And, and the prophet, he gets that heavenly touch that only God could give. That, that, this, putting that meal in, that was enough. I, if God would have done that, I'd have been happy. But I'll tell you, so many times God don't just come through. But God exceeds our expectations. God don't just satisfy this. That reminds me of the Olive Garden, don't it? You get them breadsticks and they just keep bringing them, don't they? That's what this boy did. They got enough to eat out of that soup and here comes the, the bread. You get that bread and there's more bread because it says that's leftovers. You may say, what's the application? How do we apply this to their church? How do we apply this? We live in a broken, fallen uh perverted uh, world, corrupt, that's full of sin in this sin-cursed world. That's where we live. And instead of us being more like the world, instead of us leaving the house one individual at a time and trying to gather up some mess and muck and try to bring that in and let us eat off that, we need the real thing. We need Jesus. That, that mess of the world ain't going to feed us. It ain't going to be good for us. Instead of us be more like the world. The world's going to have to be more like us. Because here's the thing. What good? What good is a whole pot of soup? What good is this? If you go to taste it, you can't, you, it's bitter. What, what good is it if you, if you taste it and it tastes like death? I ain't never tasted nothing and said that's like death. What good is it if it's filled to the brim and overflowing and you, and you just can't eat it? All you can do is look at it. I believe what God's trying to say is here at Roar Creek, 
We can fill them up here up all the way up to the choir hall, but what have we got? It don't matter. We need God. We don't need people. We need God. We need his touch. We need a heavenly touch. And, and what they did is they went out hunting. And what happened? They brought in death, and there was death in that pot. It was bitter. It tasted bad. They couldn't eat it. You saying, preacher, don't go visiting? No. I'm just saying, don't, if you don't look for things on the outside to satisfy what's on the inside. And let God give us that heavenly touch. Let God. You might say, well, where's he at? He's closer to you. You ain't got to go to hunting for him. He's right here. We just got to seek him. I see a hunger. I see a hunt. Then I see that heavenly touch. I see a heavenly touch that, that healed that. And it's exactly what they needed. You know, this is a foreshadowing to that feeding of 5,000 in, in the New Testament. That boy gave that little boy fish and bread, wasn't it? And there was leftovers there as well. What's God trying to say? Well, I don't know. He, he just wanted me to preach on death in a pot. He wanted me to preach on our church. He wanted me to share that, hey, we got to have him. we got to have him. Well, what about so? It don't matter about you. You're here. We're here. we got to have him. We can have a whole pot full. We can have a whole house full. We can have a whole church full. But God's not here. And, it, and you can classify it as death in that pot. No matter how hungry. No matter how hungry and starving I am, if I can't eat it, it ain't no good. The heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for this thought that you've given us here this evening. And uh, thank you, Lord, for the, the help that you gave us preaching it, Lord. Lord, I know that everybody in here, I know in this world, I know everybody that may watch this message, I know everybody's hungry for something. They're looking for something. They're longing for something. But, Lord, very well that something, if you're saved, is right here on the inside. That something, is, his name's Jesus. And, and we, can try to, uh, we can try to fill in all these other details. We can uh, jump up through all these other hoops and, and act like we've got God. But what we need is you. We need you. We need you now more than ever. It don't matter what kind of pot full that we've got. If there's death in that pot and we're unable to partake of it, it, it don't matter what we've got. But Lord, you just let this be an encouragement to us. That yes, we need to be hungry. Yes, we need to go out hunt. We need to hunt for people. We need to bring people in. But the hunt is very well just right in our heart. The hunt is right here at this altar. The hunt is just opening that word of God. That hunt is that meal that was thrown in. Who's the meal? That's the bread of life. And Lord, you just help us. Let that bread be sufficient. Let that bread be enough. We ain't got to get all that mess out. We're never going to be perfect. You threw the meal in and it fixed it all. Lord, we need that heavenly touch. If we need that more than anything, living in a constant state of fear, and living in a constant uh, changing world, but Lord, you just help us. Help us have that heavenly touch. Help us desire that heavenly touch. In Jesus' name, amen.